So for our July monthly meeting, we are joined by local expert, Tony Ewa. Hi, Tony. Hi, so nice to be here. <laughs> How are you this evening? Yeah, not bad at all, thanks. Yeah, ready to go. Yeah, excellent. So this evening, our, our monthly meeting, it goes two ways. So we're here to learn from Tony, but Tony would like to learn from us um, about what lessons we can learn for zero carbon transport initiatives. What have we learned from the lockdown and, and what should we do going forward from these lessons learned? And of course, for us at CamCycle, we are very interested in learning from particularly the increase in cycling that we're not necessarily seeing in Cambridge, but we're seeing in other places around the UK. Uh, we're actually having a decline in cycling in Cambridge because people aren't traveling to work as much, uh, but across the country cycling is booming. Um, and also we know there's been impacts on public transport, more people working from home and so on. So your talk this evening, Tony, will focus on passenger transport, uh, but we might touch on um, goods transport as well, I believe. Just peripherally, yeah, but Just mainly, mainly, trans mainly passenger transport. Actually. Excellent. So Tony works with Carbon Neutral Cambridge. So hopefully as you kick off your talk, you can tell us a bit about Carbon Neutral Cambridge um, and how we can work together and uh, let's get those carbon emissions down. Um, so Tony, if you could now share your screen again, <laughs> and we'll kick things off. Yeah, can you see that? Okay. Uh, let's give it a second. Uh, not yet, have another go. And while we're working that out, I'll just say to everybody following along that we have about a minute's delay between the live stream and us actually speaking. So um, if we don't answer your question at the most sensible time, that's because we have a bit of a delay. So, so bear with us, but we're, doing the best we can. And there we go. A screen is now being shared and we're at full screen. So Tony, you are good to go. And I'm now officially going to be quiet and hand this all over to you. Okay, well, thanks for, uh, thanks so much for the invite. Um, you know, especially in CamCycle's 25th year, it's uh, great to be here. I'm a big fan of CamCycle. I've been a member for a number of years. And when we formed Carbon Neutral Cambridge, I think it's fair to say that we looked at CamCycle as being, you know, one of the models for the sort of organization that we could become many years in the future. So you're an inspiration to many groups as well as to the pure cycling campaigning that you do. And certainly when we set up the organization, we got a lot of help from people like Jim Chisholm and from David Earl. So there's a lot of synergy there between our two groups already. Um, now, at Carbon Neutral Cambridge, we're not transport experts and we're not policy experts, uh, but we're quite good with spreadsheets. And so for this exercise, we've concentrated on modeling emissions profiles under different transport scenarios. And we've been fortunate to work with people from University College London. So Isabella and Abby, I don't think can be with us tonight, but I just wanna say thanks to them because their help has been invaluable. And we looked in particular at modeling the transport emissions from the combined authorities local transport plan because they didn't do that work themselves. We thought it was particularly important to see what were the implications of the sorts of transport policies that they were suggesting and to see what alternatives might be. Now, just a quick word about modeling. I mean, the thing we all know about models is that in detail they're wrong. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful. So to give you an example, the Imperial College model of how COVID-19 might spread in the UK, um, we know for sure that some of the details were wrong, in particular about how the doubling was happening in uh, the early part of the pandemic. But nonetheless, the overall model demonstrated to the government that the effects on the health service could be sufficiently large that they really did, needed to act. And that, and that I think is a good example of where a model um, led to policy change. Now, back in January this year, uh, as China closed Wuhan, which is a city of 11 million people, a number of analysts in the UK were saying, well, of course that could only happen because China's a totalitarian state. We could never see that happen here. So hopefully COVID doesn't come to the UK. Well, we all know what happened. They were able to close down London. They were able to close down Cambridge 
able to close down most of the UK. So let's not try and second guess what's possible once people realize that they're in an emergency. Now, I know that with COVID dominating the news, um, probably you don't want to be told that climate change is a greater threat than COVID-19, but I'm afraid that is the, that, that is the truth. And global heating is, and hence climate change, is driven by the, largely by the quantity of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in particular by carbon dioxide. And it's the cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that matters. So even if overnight we could halve global emissions, we'd still be putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and hence adding to that blanket that surrounds the earth and causes the heating that we're seeing. So that's why it's so important that we get to zero emissions, not just reduce our emissions. Now, a brief word about carbon accounting. Most international agreements are based on production emissions. So that essentially means the emissions that are produced within a particular area of interest, be that the UK, be that Cambridge. So to give you an example, if you buy a new car from Marshalls, maybe the steel chassis was made in China, maybe the upholstery was made in Romania, maybe the engine was manufactured in Germany, none of the emissions associated with those activities would contribute to the UK's production emissions, but they would contribute to the UK's emissions under consumption accounting. So consumption accounting is probably closer to what most people would think of as their carbon footprint, but it's more difficult to measure. So I'll be talking mostly about production emissions, although we'll touch on consumption every now and again. So in order to stay with the Paris Agreement, and let's remember that almost all the countries in the world, with one or two notable exceptions, have signed up to the Paris Agreement, including the UK. So if we're going to keep to the Paris Agreement, what are the targets that we need to meet in terms of emissions? Well, a number of different organisations have said what they think should be different targets, ranging from XR saying we need to be net zero by 2025 to the government saying we need to be net zero by 2050. But really the atmosphere doesn't care at all about the date by which a country or a region gets to net zero. All that the atmosphere is concerned about is the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So Instead of talking about dates, really we should be talking about carbon budgets. So to be carbon, to be Paris compliant, we know that globally from 2020 onwards, we can emit about 700 billion tons of carbon dioxide to have a two thirds chance of staying well below two degrees Celsius. So we can take that global carbon budget and then assign that to different countries and then different countries can then subdivide that into different regions. It's not a trivial exercise, but it's one that's been done by some academics from Manchester. So when they do that, we get a carbon budget for the combined authority of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And that comes to a total of about 32 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. And given that about 45% of the emissions in the combined authority is due to transport, that means that for transport emissions from 2020 onwards to be Paris compliant, we've got a budget of about 15 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. So you might want to keep that figure uh, in the back of your head, 15 million tonnes for transport for the combined authority from 2020 onwards. And that roughly means that we need to reduce the emissions at about 14% year on year. So what has actually been the historical change in transport emissions in Cambridgeshire? So this is a chart taken from uh, a report produced by Cambridgeshire County Council in 2015 and they had a carbon reduction target in there. Hooray! Um, and that was that by 2020 they'd have reduced their carbon emissions by 20% compared to 2005. So that's the, the red, solid red line that you see there. 
And if you project that solid red line, then you've reached to zero transport emissions in 2080. And that equates to a total carbon of about um, 45 million tons. So in other words, three times the transport budget that we've got to stay being Paris compliant. But that's okay because maybe Cambridgeshire has done much better than they planned. Let's have a look at what's actually happened. Well, sadly, no. Uh, the latest figures that we have for, which are for 2018, suggest that the actual emissions have been 25% more than the County Council was projecting. And that's despite all of the green talk that there was in that local transport plan about how they were going to increase active transport, how they were going to put in more cycle lanes, blah, blah, blah. And actually, this chart makes me really angry. They set a woefully inadequate target, which they've then missed by a country mile. And where's the outcry? Who's being held responsible? This is our children's future that they're messing with. This is not a nice to have. This is an essential. Okay, so let's look a bit more closely at where transport emissions come from. So here we've broken down on the bottom, the local authorities, which combine together, combine the combined authority. And the different colors show the different types of vehicle modes. And in red, we can see emissions that come from cars. Let's have a look at the emissions from buses because whenever we've asked people what are the things which we can do to reduce emissions from transport in Cambridge? The number one thing that comes back is we need electric buses. Okay, well, you can see that buses account for just this blue, blue bar. It's a very small amount. And clearly, if we want to do anything about transport emissions in the combined authority, the thing that nearly needs to be tackled is the transport emissions from cars. So I'm going to move on now to showing you some of the modeling results. But first of all, let's look at the modeling assumptions for the two models I'm going to be showing you. One for the combined authority local transport plan, and then one for the carbon neutral Cambridge um, model. And we've been fairly um, optimistic, I think you would say, in most of the assumptions that we've made. So for the population, we've assumed a fairly low population increase. For electric vehicle uptake, we've been very bullish on the amount of uh, the transition from petrol and diesel cars to electric cars. And we've been fairly bullish on the way that the national grid can decarbonize itself. And then when it comes to car demand, uh, the big thing in the combined authority local transport plan was the famous Cam Metro. We took simply at face value their, their uh, timings on when the CAM Metro would come to be. And we took it completely at face value, uh, the passenger numbers and the way that that would displace cars. And then for our own uh, model, uh, we haven't used the CAM Metro. Instead, we've relied on removing cars um, through carrots and sticks and for very, fairly bullish numbers on bicycles and e-bikes with mileage doubling by 2025 and doubling again by 2030. So let's look at um, if I can get the next slide. Um, let's look at some of the results. So this is the result for the modeling for the combined authorities local transport plan with the same color scheme. So in red, we've got cars. You can see that um, under this model, transport emissions continue to rise until 2024, which is when the first phase of the CAM Metro is due to come, come into force. Um, and under this scenario, trans passenger transport emissions um, total 18 million tons goods transport emissions total 35 million tonnes. So very well short of national and local 
transport targets. And then under our own scenario, we see we have transport emissions peaking in 2019. Um, and if you add up the passenger transport emissions, it comes to 18 million tons for goods transport, about, sorry, 13 million tons for goods transport, 12 million tons. So it's significantly better than the combined authority local transport plan, but still well short of being Paris compliant. So on all of these models, the biggest thing that you see is the emissions that come from cars. So we keep being told that um, electric cars are the thing of the future. These are the things which are going to solve um, climate change. Let's just have a look, closer look at um, electric cars. Um, sorry. Um, the thing about electric cars is, um, although cars, electric car sales are increasing rapidly, they're carrying off a very small base. So in 2017, only less than, only around half of 1% were plug-in hybrids or battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric cars. And it's projected that this year, about 10% of those same vehicles um, will be new car sales. So that means that this year we're expecting around 90% of new car sales to be either petrol or diesel. Now, given that the fleet lasts for a turnover of the fleet is about 10 years, that means that those cars that are being sold today are still going to be around in 10 years time by 2030. So the timing just doesn't work for electric cars to impact our climate targets. And I think that's been summed up um, probably quite nicely by Kevin Anderson. He says, we need to get away from this idea of moving 80 kilograms of flesh around cities in two tons of metal. I think it's cars, it's, I think it's clear that cars simply don't belong in cities. So building EV charging infrastructure in cities is a terrible idea. Well said, Kevin. Okay, so what are our other transport options? So let's just look at, um, at a few. Well, at the moment, for a typical um, small sedan car, uh, petrol powered or diesel power, petrol powered, its emissions are about 150 grams of CO2 per kilometer. For a bicycle, um, its emissions are about 30 grams of CO2 per kilometer if you're on a vegan diet, going up to about 60 grams of CO2 per kilometer if you're on a reasonably high meat diet. And for those who are on um, extremely uh, meat intensive diets, such as the Atkins, it goes way above that. And compare that with um, an electric bike. And this is using figures for the current figures from the national grid. Um, its emissions are about 10 grams of CO2 per kilometer. So a big difference. So the key question is, can we get people to switch from cars to electric bikes? And bear in mind that at the moment, new electric cars, um, the, the government has something like a 35% um, subsidy on new, new sales, whereas electric bikes have no subsidy. So just to wrap up, uh, decades of car-centric uh, policy decisions have led us to this current woeful situation where only extremely radical changes in the way that we use our transportation are going to meet our climate goals. It's going to require the rapid removal of cars from metropolitan areas. It's going to require us to, at the same time, rapidly grow active from public transport and it's going to require a halt to the growth agenda. That doesn't mean we stop building uh, houses. Um, the some that are already decided based on the local plan, but it does mean that the kind of uh, hyper growth uh, situation that we have being planned by some um, authorities, that's going to have to go by the by. Thanks. I'm open for ideas. 
Thank you, Tony. I'm just putting a little nudge on the Facebook comments now for questions to come through. Uh, so please do let us know if you have a question for Tony. Um, and if you can't comment on Facebook, we've got we're monitoring uh, Twitter. And you know what, you could even send an email or send me a text message. And I will pass those questions on. We're doing our utmost to be as accessible as we can for everybody. Um, but we know we've got a slight delay with the Facebook coming through. So we'll, I'm just talking to fill the space until the presentation's finished for everybody else and we get those um, questions. There we go. Oh, Anna's beaten me to the questions. Right, some questions that came through earlier for you, Tony. So uh, we have, what is the environmental cost of your average electric bike battery and how many it just jumped away. And how many miles need to be cycled before it breaks even in environmental terms? Uh, yeah, well, we're, for most of the talk, we've been speaking um, purely about the emissions that are operating. So the question is coming up about the emissions associated with the battery. Um, I don't have a good, a good answer to that, but I think, um, the emissions are rather small. What's, what's perhaps of more concern is um, things like lithium and rare earths, which are used in construction of batteries. Um, and what we need to do to be get much better at is recycling the way that we, um, we use these components. But the actual emissions, the actual carbon emissions associated with producing the batteries is relatively small. So small carbon emissions, but possibly some other ethical considerations as well in the sourcing of the materials for those batteries. Yeah. Um, bear with me, I'm reading some other questions. Okay, we've got one from Tim. Do you have some thoughts on the impact of working from home? Um, I think what's been really, uh, really interesting during the COVID pandemic is the way that we've seen patterns of work changed so dramatically uh, with people working from home. Um, and what's the complete unknown is as and when the pandemic uh, peters out and we start to restrict, uh, lift the restrictions, uh, to what extent some of the uh, behaviors become in, we've adopted become embedded or to whether or not um, we stretch back to our, our old methods. Um, I think anybody who's campaigning on climate and on transport really hopes that we can embed some of these uh, behavioural changes that we've seen deeply into our new behaviours in the future. Absolutely. Um, and I think something that you, you said during your talk, and then I've, I've written it down, is that that feeling before the, the pandemic of, or as the pandemic was starting, that we could never have that happen here. We can't do that in our, in our country. And, and I think that we've heard that so much about the rapid kind of change that would be required to prevent and adapt to climate change. Um, just something that we could never do, or the economy, but look at what we've managed to do now and so quickly. And as much as this is a devastating time, I believe I'm not the only person that's also seen this glimmer of hope in, wow, we can actually rally to do this, we can rally to deal with climate change and our other major social issues. And, and I hope that we haven't put everything into the pandemic and not, not thought about how we can take this into dealing with climate change. Um, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely on board with that. I think um, the, the biggest failure to date has been our failure of our imagination. And one of the things that uh, this pandemic has taught us is that uh, actually when we're really forced into a corner, we can break free with our imagination. So, you know, let's do that with all the other social changes that we need to make. Yeah. And I think it's, it's not just the ideas that we've had in this time, but that we've been allowed to act on our imagination and allowed to do it quickly. And, and we've found ways to just make things happen. Um, and I know that being involved in my local mutual aid, I've seen how quickly um, we've actually been able to do things that normally would take a year just to get set up and we've just had to do it because we've had to. The same things happened with cam cycle as well. Um, right, another question. Uh, I'm not sure who this one's come from, but um, bearing in mind, we've seen an almost complete shutdown in transport for two months and it barely dented emissions. Say we see an even worse scenario that we are currently seeing 
um, like wildfires and Arctic heating, the extreme summer temperatures, and I'm particularly concerned about that as an Australian. Um, yeah. What does it look like for the average family here? And assuming we have a competent government, would they even consider restrictions and what types? Bearing in mind Australia and New Zealand did so this year with the fires. Uh, not even Australia or New Zealand did so in response to the fires. Uh, what's the linkage between weather and having to stop filling up with petrol? Right, that that went on a little bit, but did you get the Okay, gist well, there's, there's quite a few uh, questions inside there, so let's, let's try and unpack it, and uh, yeah. hopefully you can add, add to the questions as they come. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, let's look at what happened to um, carbon emissions uh, during the height of, the, of uh, lockdown. Um, globally, um, we saw a maximum reduction of 17%, 1.7 in uh, CO2 emissions. Now that's not insignificant. Um, and that's mainly due as transport was shut down. Um, so it illustrates that um, it's a long way from zero. It means there's a lot of other things apart from uh, the transportation that we've got to tackle, uh, but it's a not insignificant amount. So if we could lock in um, some of those transportation changes that we had at the peak of lockdown, then that would absolutely be a, a big step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, what was the next part of the question? Uh, so I think that the next part was, I would say we've seen that even in Australia and New Zealand with such drastic impacts of climate change, the, wild, the wildfires, the government there had no real climate change response and and as an Australian I was following that and and seeing them saying let's not bring politics that's political don't talk about that we need to deal with the the fires but just this complete unwillingness to actually talk about the root causes and climate change and I think in a way they got away with that because then the pandemic hit and they've not been held accountable for for not even considering the climate change impacts um, yeah. for those okay. well, the, you know, there's a big question in there about um, how do we get change and what contributes to change and how do we get uh, governments to change. Mm. And I think there's several, several steps to there. Um, I mean, politicians um, don't always lead. Very often um, they will follow public opinion. So um, I'm reminded of uh, Barack Obama when he first took office. He was asked about gay marriage and he said, no, no, I don't think um, the United States is ready for gay marriage yet. Uh, but as soon as it became clear that public opinion on this was changing, he was, he was very much at the forefront of it. Mm -hmm. So I think we're gonna see the same thing with, with climate change. As long as politicians feel that uh, the public at large doesn't care, then they won't put it high up on their agenda. And as soon as they feel that this is a real political issue, and that getting re-elected might depend upon how seriously they take the issue of climate change, then I think we will see politicians of whatever hue uh, take a real interest and enact policy on it. I think that's a real frustration because at, at times like these, we need leadership. We need, the, we need our leaders to be taking us on the journey as well as us as constituents telling our leaders what we need, but there needs to be both. And, and at the moment, it seems it's very reactive to, to votes and short-term votes, as opposed to taking some big, bold chances and explaining why they need to be done. But we're starting to see some examples of that leadership around the world. So, so there's yeah, some- and it, and it also doesn't just depend upon um, national government policy, as useful as that is. Uh, we also need to see changes happening at a municipal level, at a city level, state level, um, as well as at our workplace level, as an individual level. So it's all levels that we need to, we need to get change at. And I think we're seeing on the climate front, um, big changes happening at city level, especially in countries like the US, which don't have good national policy, but are having very interesting and exciting policies at uh, lower levels. I think Paris is an interesting one to watch as well. They, uh, with the recent elections, there's now a mandate to go for it in Paris, which is very exciting. Well, Anne Hidalgo, um, in a second um, Green Paper, uh, said that she would remove 66% of on-street car parking from Paris. Well, she's just been elected for a six-year term. Yeah, very exciting. Right, 
We have a question from Anthony Carpin. Uh, several questions by the look of it. I'll start with one. Um, any thoughts on why we haven't got electric buses when other cities have them? Um, I guess that's um, a question for Stagecoach, Stagecoach East. Mm -hmm. um, as he probably knows, um, we're hoping that bus franchising is going to come to the combined authority uh, this year or early next year. And hopefully at that point, um, we will then have uh, democratically more of a say in how our bus transportation systems are run. Um, and at that point, um, there may be a possibility of demanding that we have electric bus transport. Um, so yeah, I am a big fan of electric buses, um, but as you see, showed earlier, um, in the overall scheme of things, it's, it's a fairly small fry. Mm. Um, when you when I saw that that graph, I was quite taken aback because I guess we see buses and they're big and they can be quite smelly. But when that that graph really gave me a bit of a mind shift, is that yes, the priority is moving those private cars off off the roads. Um, and we should still be using the buses we have because it helps with that. But then also if we're buying new buses, then let's get make sure they're as clean as possible. Yep, um, another question from Anthony. Oh, they're coming through quickly now. So I'll move through more quickly and be less chatty. Okay. Um, any thoughts on linking segregated cycle routes to leisure, leisure facilities? So for example, the ice rink, Cambridge United um, Football Club, the junction, the corn exchange. Um, have there been any conversations between transport organizations, groups, and those institutions that you're aware of? Okay, let's um, let's talk a little bit about segregated cycle routes, uh, which I know you must be a big fan of. Um, I mean, every every time there's any sort of infrastructure uh, review, you know, the big thing that comes up is uh, yeah, let's have more segregated cycle lanes. Um, and yet, year after year, the amount of segregated cycle lanes that we're able to build is pitifully small. Um, and we know that the barrier to cycling is because people don't feel it's safe. Um, but if we can't roll out segregated cycle lanes at the rate that's compatible with getting people out of their cars, then perhaps we need to take a different approach. And maybe that approach is simply move cars off the roads and then the roads become safe for people to cycle. So um, segregated cycle lanes are a great idea in principle, if you're going to mix them with cars. Personally, I, from what I can see about transport emissions, we've got to remove the cars. So let's just remove the cars and let's use the streets for, for cycles. And we've seen with the, the rapid changes that we've had to implement to make more space for cycling during the pandemic that modal filters are a very quick, cheap and effective way of, of doing that. Reduce that through traffic and you have those back streets suddenly very safe for cycling. Yeah. Um, and what I noticed in the Netherlands last year, particularly in Amsterdam, is that they've started taking cycle lanes almost out and giving the car lanes back to cyclists, but the, the people cycling are in such a majority that they own the road space and the cars are guests. And they've had to do that because there, there are just so many bikes they won't fit in in lanes so at some point that that scale just tips over where where the cyclists are in that road space yeah and i think um, also there that they're, they're finding that there was um an issue between uh, electric bikes and, and pedal bikes uh that in the cycle lanes uh pedal bikes are going much slower than electric bikes and that was causing um some congestion yeah yeah um, sort of the, the sort of those first world cycling problems, aren't they? Oh, really? uh, the next question I have from uh, Matthew Danish. Transport is driven by land use. For example, sprawl causes driving. Um, how do we change our planning system so that the resulting carbon emissions from land use and transport is reduced to zero? And I'm very passionate about this. We have to get it right from the start with our planning. Yeah, absolutely. And um... You know, any time I, I cycle through somewhere like Adambrooks, you know, which is supposed to be this world-class um, biomedical facility, you know, I'm, I'm taken by the fact that uh, this is a new construction and yet we can't put in any decent infrastructure for, for cyclists. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling. Um, and so I'm not particularly optimistic that um, 
new plans for new developments are going to are going to include that. Um, so it's why I'm I'm really against sort of again coming back to segregated lanes. I'm not really a big fan of segregated lanes. I think we've just got to take out the cars and let cycles and uh, and electric bikes use them. But in terms of the planning, uh, I mean the big thing is the local plan. It's essential that we try and um, use the local plan as a way of um, driving towards zero zero emissions. Um, I know there's a number of people like Paul Frayner who are passionate about this um, and we've just got to give them the support that we can. Absolutely. We, we need to influence that local plan, don't we? Because we do. that influences the developments, that influences the transport, that influences the carbon emissions. Um, but most of the time we don't realise the problems until things are already being built and it's very hard from, from that point. Uh, okay, a question from... Uh, Nigel, where is it? There it is. Can you explain again why you suggest that my emissions when cycling would be much lower if I rode an e-bike instead? It sounds as if you're assuming that I would eat much less if I rode an e-bike. I'm assuming it's more about exertion, but uh, what can you explain that for us, Tony? Yeah, it's, um, it's the extra energy that you need to expend compared to uh, either sitting on a bike um, or sitting at a desk. Um, I'm not going to go through the actual calculation. I'll let you. I'll let folks do the calculation as their homework. Uh, but let's think very briefly about um, comparing uh, riding a bike and the energy that you need to ride a bike compared with um, riding an electric bike. I mean, in both cases, the energy is ultimately coming from the sun. In the case of riding a bike. Um, the sunlight is being captured by plants. And plants are very inefficient at capturing sunlight. They're very good at capturing carbon dioxide compared to anything that machines can do. But compared to a photovoltaic cell, they're very poor at capturing um, sun sunlight. So that's the first part. Then when we've um, grown a plant, we're very inefficient in the way that we use that plant. Generally, we throw half of it away. So if we've grown a lettuce, we tend to eat the leaves and throw away the roots. If we've grown carrots, we tend to eat the carrot and throw away the leaves. Uh, then the human body is actually quite inefficient in the way that it turns food into energy and then uses that energy in muscles to power the pedals. That compares to an electric motor, which is very, very efficient at converting electrons from photovoltaic cells into mechanical power to power the, the wheels. So that's why the emissions from an electric bike are much less than the emissions from a regular pedal bike. That's not to say I'm not a fan of um, pedal bikes. I only have a pedal bike myself. I ride it every single day. It's part of my health routine. It's, there's great things about pedal bikes, but if we're just, just looking purely at emissions, electric bikes are much, much more efficient than pedal bikes. I think that's the key point there, looking at the operating emissions, but the uh, emissions to actually produce the electric bike might be more than the, the pedal bike. And it assumes that we're eating to compensate, I suppose, for the energy that we're, we're putting out. Um, uh, well, it has to, because the energy can't come from nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the carbon emissions to produce the bike, uh, the, main, the main emissions are associated with the steel for the frame, there is some extra emissions from the battery, but they're relatively small. Um, so the only other thing is the uh, the issue of uh, lithium and rare earths, which we, we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Kerry. Uh, rural residents will always argue that they need their cars for transport. Any thoughts on how to tackle that mindset? Or is that a topic that we just accept? What do you think, Tony? Uh, my feeling is yes, we accept it. Um, you know, for people who are fortunate enough to, to live in Cambridge and other metropolitan areas, I think there's absolutely no need for a car if you're an able-bodied person. Uh, if you're a blue badge holder, then you probably you will need a car probably. Um, but for people who live in rural areas, that's a different that's a different kettle of fish. Until we can really put in effective um, public transport systems. Then I think they have a right to um, be able to use their car. Um, and I think one of the things we've, we've 
got to learn is we've got to bring people with us on on this journey. And uh, we can see uh, with the issues over the Mill, Mill Road Bridge closure, it doesn't matter how much we think we're in the right, we've got to be able to bring people with them and convince them of, of uh, what's the right thing to do. And, and they've got to be convinced that it's good for them as well. And it might be a case, it's not that you don't need your car, but do you need to use your car for all of those journeys? Um, I have a lot of family members that live in the country and like, why do you drive your car just down to the shop? You're in the country, you have a car, but that's still a, a biking distance. And I'm the weird person that gets the old rusty bike out of the shed, just to live by my values in the countryside. Um, so it can still be done. Um, okay, another question coming through. Um, how do the housing needs of Cambridge fit in with reducing growth? Do you think new developments on the edge of Cambridge, for example, Marshall's, the North East Cambridge development, can work if they are built as zero carbon communities? Or is it all growth, or is all growth a risk to our local environment and water levels? Um, how can we avoid people working in Cambridge but having to commute in from so far away? Wow, there's a lot of questions in there. I know, you're um, getting some really big questions today. <laughs> there, there's some, there's some, there are great questions. Uh, they're yeah. really difficult to answer. Okay, let's start with the, with the last, part, last part first. Mm -hmm. um, how do we stop people commuting in long distances into Cambridge? Uh, well, maybe this is one of the lessons that we can learn from COVID, uh, that if needs must, um, apparently we can reduce the amount of travel that we need to and still be able to operate our businesses. Um, most people that I know um, weren't familiar with uh, video conferencing techniques, uh, not for using their work, until they really had to. Um, there's been a, a very steep learning curve, but I think most people have been surprised how effectively it can work. Uh, not everybody will be able to work from home, of course, uh, but if people can work from home even one day a week, uh, that would have an enormous impact on our transport emissions. Um, you know, I think one of the things about COVID is it, it's taught us perhaps what are some of the things that are important in our lives. And I think a lot of people are saying, well, actually, you know what, um, that holiday in the Seychelles, which I thought was so important to, to me, it now seems to be that actually being able to meet up with my friends and meet up with local family members, to have a picnic in the park, those are the things which are really important to me. So, you know, maybe um, working a four day week instead of a six day week, maybe that's something we could move to. Maybe um, working more from home, maybe that's something we can walk to. So maybe these are some of the things that we can use to prevent people from transporting themselves and their two ton car uh, long distances into Cambridge. Now I've forgotten what some of the earlier parts of that question were. I think, um... I guess we've still got this issue of reducing growth and and still having growth in housing and and I guess what this comes back to to me is what do we mean by reducing growth because it might be okay to grow if it's not having an impact or a negative impact on carbon emissions so we're talking about building zero carbon communities if that's actually possible is that still a problem but I think there are other environmental impacts for example water is a big issue in Cambridge at the moment. So uh, I guess, you know, how do we balance that need to still have places for people to live, but to reduce growth or reduce the impact of that growth? Yeah, well, I mean, just to follow on from part of the last answer, I mean, partly we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is the purpose of all this growth? Um, you know, there's some growth that may be necessary. We we'd certainly want to see growth in the number of council houses we have um, in the region. We want to see growth of opportunities for young people. We want to see growth in the opportunities for people who are unemployed, who have uh, very tough situations in life. Um, but I think what we've seen in Cambridge and surrounding regions in the last few years is a large amount of speculative growth of um, apartment buildings, which we know are owned by people who are living overseas who are just trying to uh, buy to rent and, and speculative property. So we must get out of this speculative uh, property boom. Uh, the other part of the question about the wider environmental concerns, not just carbon emissions, 
I know water is something that's uh, a great concern in, in this area, and, um, and I don't know the answer to that question. It's certainly going to be very, very tough. Uh, I mean, within this year, due to the effects of, uh, of climate change, we've gone from uh, February, I think, was one of the wettest Februarys we've seen in the last 120 years, and May was one of the driest Mays we've had in the last 120 years. I mean, that's not just have an impact on the water supply and the water flow that we see through the camp. That has an enormous impact if you're a farmer. And, and we know East Anglia is a very important farming region. This puts your planting plans um, completely up in the air. So we've, we've got to be paying much closer attention to the way that we use water to not over extract. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to pay real close attention to climate because we're already starting to see some serious impacts on climate change within our region. Yes, it's a whole system, isn't it? <laughs> it completely is. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to ask these last few questions and we'll lock it down, but we're getting such good questions, so I'm, I'm, I'm letting it go. Um, so a question from Tom, how does Cambridgeshire transport carbon, oh, how does the Cambridgeshire transport carbon budget compared to the whole budget, i.e. heating, manufacturing, and so on. So um, for context, there's a huge gas main going into North Stowe at the moment. Um, so having good cycling links to that development might not make any difference um, if it's still a, a carbon heavy development. So what proportion does transport yeah, make? So, so transport's about 40% of our emissions. Uh, so it's, a, it's the largest chunk. Um, and it's the chunk which we've made the least progress on reducing. Uh, I think we saw in the charts between 2012 and 2017, we saw transport emissions rise by 14% in our region, at a time when they should be drastically reducing. Um, the other, the other areas where we see emissions in our homes and in industry, we have made some progress in reducing those, but uh, not nearly enough. Um, in terms of the carbon intensity of the electricity grid, that's one of the UK's great success stories. Nationally, we've phased out um, almost all of our coal-fired power stations. That's had a, a tremendous impact on the carbon intensity of the grid whilst at the same time we've been building up renewables. So that's a great UK success story. One of the great unknowns is what are we gonna do with gas? And that's, uh, I guess, part of his question with this gas pipeline that is, is noticed. Clearly, if we want to get to zero emissions, we've got to stop burning fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And that includes not just petrol and diesel in our cars and vans, but it also means uh, gas in our homes and in our industries. And how we get off gas um, is one of the topics of massive research at the moment. Um, domestically, we've got uh, the possibility of um, heat pumps. Uh, but I think just today, the government announced that uh, they were going to be rolling out a three billion pound uh, package for Home, ins home and uh, buildings insulation. Uh, it's a great thing. Um, we know that energy saving is massively more important uh, than almost any other measure that we can take when it comes to reducing our carbon emissions. Um, Three billion sounds like a lot, um, but the Committee on Climate Change estimates that for uh, these sort of energy saving measures, it should be about 10 times that amount. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this isn't a cycling question, but let's go for it. Um, what is the predicted percentage uptake of new and retrofit air source heat pumps versus new gas central heating? So we're building on from that, from that theme um, over the next decade. Is it the assumption that air source heat pumps will become cheaper or get a subsidy versus gas boilers? And I think there's retrofitting, but also building this technology into these new developments that we've been talking about as well. Yeah, um, well, the government's um, made it clear that uh, you won't be able to install gas into 
uh, new developments from, uh, I think it's 2022. Uh, so then new developments will be uh, electric uh, heating. Um, in terms of uh, subsidies for uh, heat pumps, uh, yes, I hope Rishi Sunak is, is listening in tonight. Uh, Chancellor, yeah, please let's have those. Uh, one of the barriers for uh, installing heat pumps, certainly in, in Cambridge, is just the expense. Uh, but it's, we've got to phase out gas. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, heat pumps do offer that opportunity, but it is, it is an expensive uh, change. But as we've seen, when we need to make rapid change, it's remarkable that we can do so. And if we just say this has to be done, I'm sure we'll find a way to, to do it and bring that cost down or spread yeah, that cost out in a different way. We were being told, um, you know, a year ago that there was no manage, mani, magic money tree. Uh, and now we've seen that actually, yeah, there is. Uh, so, yeah, let's, let's use the money in um, really productive ways to save our environment. And I think more so than ever, we need to have a green recovery. We need to make jobs. We need to have some form of economic stimulus. Um, if we're sticking with the same economic system, but let's let's use that that urgency to put into these big projects that we need to become more um, low carbon or no carbon. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I've avoided uh, using the hashtag build back better because uh, it's just become so ubiquitous, but it, but it is true. We need to build back better. Um, and a green recovery is also about jobs. It's about apprenticeships. Uh, it's about retrofitting. This is, these are jobs for the next 20 years. Um, and absolutely, those, the green recovery, a green new deal, these are the things that we absolutely need. Absolutely. Now, Tony, I've, I've closed the questions to our audience, but um, while you have the floor, are there any questions that you have for us? I probably can't give you the answer right now, but I will take those to our members and come back to you. So what are your questions for, for us or what would you like us to do? Uh, OK, well, these are some of the questions I guess um, I'd like to know. Um, I mean, we know from surveys that uh, the vast majority of people are concerned about climate change. We know that the vast majority of people want to see more action on climate change. And yet when it comes to individuals actually uh, changing their behavior, this is much more difficult. So I guess I'd like to know from the, the membership of the, um, the cycling campaign, is how seriously do they take the issue of climate change? How, issue, how seriously do they think the uh, issue of getting to uh, zero carbon emissions is? And do they think that uh, the sorts of measures that we've laid out in terms of uh, phasing out cars from our metropolitan areas rapidly, do, we, do they think that's uh, doable? Do they want to see it happen? Or are they still, are you still for segregated cycle lanes? Thanks, Tony. I think that's a really interesting one. And I, I think it will stir up a good amount of debate within Cam Cycle. And I imagine probably the perspectives on that will be very different now, even than they were a year or two or five years ago, because so much has been about those segregated cycle lanes but if you have a massive reduction in cars do you need them or do you need as many and that's something when you've hung your campaigning hat on it you know but we need to be challenging our thinking all the time and, and make sure that we're thinking many years ahead not just in the immediate term so i will uh, before i say thank you uh tony i can see one of our trustees matthew danish has just popped in um, because he's got the next item for an update, but I think he's put his hand up. So Matt, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, actually, I think the point you're making about segregated cycleways isn't at all at odds with what Camp Cycle believes in, and certainly car reduction is, is also the Dutch approach first. So I just want to be clear, you know, what they do is they try to reduce the number of motor vehicles using streets first and foremost, and that's that's the basis of their cycle network. And it's only where you have roads that still have too much speed or volume uh, because they perform a distribution function for the motor vehicle network 
that you then re, uh, resort to separation and protection. So that is absolutely compatible with what we and the Dutch promote. So I, I totally take your point on that, but please don't put us in some kind of everything must be segregated bin. It's all about the context, really. Thank you. Good, got you. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> as we've seen, you know, with the with the pandemic, that huge push for those modal filters, because that urgent, rapid change has had to be had to be done. And um, yes, we've been pushing for that kind of infrastructure. Right. Well, Tony, clearly it's so hard when there's no audience. Um, it's really hard to just speak to a screen. But given the quantity and the quality of the questions we've had this evening, I think that the audience would be applauding and saying thank you for a really wonderful talk that really got us thinking. I know certainly for me, I my brain is whirring. So here's a virtual <laughs> applause for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I try to make it conversational so you don't feel like you're just speaking to nobody. Um, but you know, we're learning really quickly. How do we do things differently in this context as well? Yes, but we're getting some cl some claps on Facebook for you. So so thank you so much, Tony. And by all means, uh, stick around for the, the rest of the meeting. We won't be here for much longer. Um, and we know that you do pop into our CAM cycle meetings. So hopefully we'll see you in person soon. But yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Forward to catching up with you soon. I'm going to go off for some dinner, I think. <laughs> yeah, sounds fair. Yeah. Um, and we'll send you all the links and so on so you can share this talk as well. But thank you so much, Tony. Thanks. OK, bye. Bye. Okay, there we go. So, um, bringing back Zoom, excellent. Okay, everybody, as I mentioned before, I've had this miraculous uh, couple of days off work and I know that things are changing so quickly at the moment that I might not be up to speed on everything. So um, I invited uh, Matthew Danish who's been working so hard, so incredibly hard and constantly on our Spaces to Breathe campaign um, and supporting people all over Cambridgeshire with their local campaigning needs as well um, as we try and react to the urgent need for uh, cycling and safe transport around our cities. Um, so I will just say to um, people who are following along, if you've got any questions just about cycling in general uh, or what's happening in Cambridge at the moment, um, now's your chance. So do jump on board and ask away. Um, but I believe Matt may have a few updates about Mill Road, which is always a very hot topic. So Matt, would you like to give us an update? Uh, thanks, Roxanne. Um, I guess I've just heard this as well, and I'm sure some of you already have as well, but the uh, ANPR cameras are due to be installed on Thursday, according to the Highways Committee hearing today. So hopefully that will help sort out some of the chaotic issues regarding uh, drivers who are not following the signs and going through the closure point. And, and then hopefully they can then move on to fixing up the landscaping and all the other issues that we highlighted and making the street um, open for people to safely social distance and the shops to open safely and have people going to the cafes and the and the various shops along Mill Road. Yeah, I, I can vouch as one of those people who had a rather aggressive encounter with a driver on, on Mill Road and it's uh, it feels a little bit like we we've, we've potentially filtered out lots of responsible drivers, but there's a bit of aggression still there. Um, so hopefully we get those changes soon. Um, but we haven't seen many other changes around the place yet, have we? Uh, yeah, that's correct. In the, in the city centre, there have been um, expanded pavements put into place in some places, such as I believe on Regent Street. Um, they, there's the one-way system also, but uh, in terms of experimental traffic regulation orders, apart from that, um, Mill Road and something actually left over from the King's Parade uh, barrier installation, which by the way is back in operation now. Um, there has not been any further, uh, there's been a few, actually been a few temporary traffic regulation orders out in the countryside in that, like Huntingdonshire around recycling uh, areas, but uh, that, that's it pretty much. 
So I guess I would say to our members and to people who are watching, we need to keep up the pressure. So if you haven't signed our Spaces to Breathe letter yet, it's still relevant. Please get on and sign that. Um, if you have ideas for where you think things um, need to be changed or implemented, uh, use our form and tell us where they, those places are. Tell us your ideas, we're passing those on. And there are still more phases of funding and more phases of changes to come. So, so do let us know um, so that we can share those. You can find that on our website at uh, camcycle.org.uk forward slash spaces to breathe. Um, on there, we've also listed other ways you can take action, but we must keep up the pressure. We must be writing to our local councillors, particularly our county councillors, um, but even MPs, city councillors, uh, business leaders in your area, I think it's really important that we're influencing um, any stakeholder that we can to try and get things happening. Um, and I will say that if there's someone that you think we should be speaking with, get in touch because we've got our presentation, we've been We've been showing that CamCycle's got some excellent thought leadership here and we're really moving things on. So we're very happy to sit down and have a virtual meeting uh, with anyone that needs to learn more. So um, definitely keep the pressure up, um, I would say, um, because Cambridge and Cambridge are falling behind. We're seeing great things happening everywhere else. And so far we have some, some barriers without adequate signage on Mill Road. And that seems to be it at the moment. Um, we need to be doing more. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions coming through, so I'm assuming everybody's up to date on Cyclescape and knows what's going on, or our weekly update emails are keeping everybody informed. Um, but we've got a couple of other quick updates. Matt, you also know some things about Histon Road. Yeah, I was about to just say, I, I nearly forgot to mention Histon Road, um, which actually, in a way, does act as a kind of temporary cycling scheme. Um, the I actually I, I went to look at the the situation there, and learned from one of the uh, uh, one of the workers there that they are actively working on trying to rearrange the barriers and fix the signage uh, so that it makes sense for cycling in both directions. It is of course something that we would have preferred to have seen done straight from the start, but they are learning as they go. And so it is good to see that this is getting sorted out. Um, they, they are actively experimenting with uh, measures to have safe bypasses for both pedestrians and cyclists of the active work regions where they'll be digging up the road and things will get a bit narrow there, but there should always be a safe way. And if necessary, they will have workers stationed to, uh, to let people pass uh, or take turns passing. Excellent. And uh, I'd say thank you for being there and asking the questions and putting a bit of pressure on. But um, again, it's just so disappointing that a scheme can start and have these problems. These things need to be in place from the very beginning. And we see the same rubbish over and over again when there's construction and roadworks where people walking and cycling are very much an afterthought and they must be safe from the very beginning. Um, but uh, we know there's lots of people who have had real concerns about Histon Road, so I hope this is reassuring for them. But uh, particularly during the, the lockdown, we need our community to be reporting back. So if anyone sees changes, do let us know um, so we can share the news. Uh, other news, um, I don't know if, if people watching have seen some incredible aerial shots, I believe taken by Kite, um, of the Chisholm Trail Bridge. So it's very exciting to see that it looks to be all in one piece and uh, essentially waiting for the right time to be lifted into place. So if you haven't seen those pictures, scroll back up through our Facebook feed and you'll see these incredible pictures of the Chisholm Trail or the Abbey Chesterton Bridge uh, looking fantastic and ready to be put into place. Um, do we have any other infrastructure news before I move on to other topics, Matt? Yeah, I suppose I one, one quick thing is that the Park Street Cycle Park planning does continue. I know it's kind of fallen in the background, but I did attend the meeting um, to talk about the needs of inclusive cycle parking in Park Street and to get all the remaining, to, to talk about the remaining issues with aisle widths and distribution of stands. 
So that is actually proceeding. So, um, you know, the architects and the planning officer are working on it. So it's kind of fallen in the background, but it is, it is moving ahead. So that's good and that they are engaging. Excellent. So uh, keep your eyes peeled on Cyclescape for that, I would say. And, and, and I think I'm noticing that we're getting a bit more of our business as usual coming back. So after such sort of intense campaigning during the lockdown, we now have to also be keeping an eye on all the planning applications. Uh, as I've seen in, in the, the two hours since I've come back from holidays, there's a lot of things going on in Cyclescape, lots of threads that I need to check in about planning. Um, so we need all our volunteers back on board, ready to help um, get through all the usual planning things. Um, now we have a question. We've been asked by the BBC for a recommendation for somebody they can talk to who has just taken up cycling during the lockdown and, um, and how that's maybe changed their views on their commute or, and what their experience has been like. Uh, now, this is a bit challenging for us because generally the people we're speaking to have already been cycling. But if anybody watching this um, could put someone in touch with us, we, I think we'd love to speak to someone as well who's just taken up cycling um, during this time, particularly for their commute. Um, so please do have a think if you know someone uh, who would like to share their, their story and would like to speak to the BBC. Uh, and then in other news, um, not nothing uh, official that I can properly announce yet, but uh, CamCycle will be having a part-time summer intern joining us very soon. So I say watch this space. Um, at first we thought we wouldn't have an internship, but we've we found a way to do something. Um, and our intern will be helping us with our policy project, which stalled again during the lockdown, but we're determined it must keep moving. So I would say um, get ready for an announcement about this. And for all those people who have dipped their toe into the waters of CamCycle's cycling policies project, get ready to dive straight back in because um, more than ever, we want to get those policies um, written up and shared. So please do uh, let us know if you would like to get involved in that project or resume thinking, sharing ideas. There's a number of threads on Cyclescape and our intern will be raring to go and uh, to get stuck into that. So that is some good news. It's nice to see a bit of business as usual happening again. Um, but other than that, I think I've finished talking to a screen. Uh, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody for following along. We know that it's not ideal and the systems are hard to use and not everybody can get in. And I'd just say thank you for your patience. Thanks, thanks for sticking with us. We're really doing our best um, to try and meet as many needs as possible. So I really do appreciate that you've found your way here. You've joined us and our guest speaker. Um, and I'll just say keep on cycling and uh, Thanks so much for joining us. Bye.